Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming. Uh, we are Cube Creative, an animation studio based in Paris. We are very excited to be here for our fourth Blender conference. Today, we will share with you some of our rigging methods and uh, how it allows us to bring our characters to life in our TV shows. I know there's been a printing mistake on the schedule, so just to make sure things are extra clear, this talk um, is a bit technical. We are mostly going to talk about rigging, but don't worry, we included a lot of uh, animated GIFs, so we're keeping things fun for everyone. So first of all, a bit about ourselves. Uh, this is Manon. She's our lead uh, rigging artist, the coolest of them all. And as such, she's involved in all our projects. I will give her the microphone as soon as things get um, too technically specific about rigging. And my name is Tanguy. I'm one of the CG supervisors at uh, Cube Creatives. And I am currently in charge of the technical supervision of a show called The Seven Bears, produced by Folivari and uh, Netflix. During this talk, we will try to give you a brief overview of our rigging process at Cube Creative. First of all, I will take a few minutes to present the studio, our work, and our history with Blender for the past few years. Then I let the microphone to Manon, who will introduce you to Keith Harrig, our in-house auto rig, and take lo a look around its main features. She will then proceed to present a few additional rigging tools which make our rigging artists and animators' lives much easier. After that, I will take over to show you how we transfer everything from animation to rendering and the implication of um, such a process on rigging. And uh, lastly, I will talk about a few corner cases and challenges we met in the last few years while trying to bake hair animation. So Cube Creative is an animation studio specialized in TV series, and the studio is now part of the Xilam group. As you can see here, some of the show we create have a very cartoonish style, while others are more on the realistic side of things. Of course, this nice artistic diversity implies that our methods of creation needs to be very flexible. Manon will talk a bit about that um, in a few minutes. We've been using Blender since 2017. Before that, we were using 3ds Max on most of our projects and Maya on a few of them. Since then, we've been using Blender for the vast majority of our 3D shows. The different shows you can see here uh, were all made with uh, Blender. However, there are still a few exceptions. Some of them, like uh, De Gaulle à la Plage, are 2D shows, and we have not switched yet to Grease Pencil for those 2D productions. I personally hope that uh, we do so in the following years. Some others, like Kailu, have a long history in another software, which is 3ds Max in this case, and we have thousands of assets that would need to be adapted and translated to Blender in order to make it work. That being said, if we are lucky enough to, do, lucky enough to make a sixth season of Kailu, we sure hope to do it in Blender. I will now show you a short reel of our CG TV series, and I let Manon take, the, take it from here. Enjoy.
Hi everyone, my name is Manon Garbet and I'm the lead rigging at Cube Creative. I'm going to show you uh, the rigging tools that we developed to help us doing our job more efficiently and talk uh, about some special cases we had to deal with. Cube Creative is a studio that produces different kinds of projects. Those goes from a realistic style like Atleticus to a very cartoonish one like Kailu. That means we can have very different sort of needs for assets and our rigging work needs to be adaptive to all of those shows. One of our specialties are TV shows, which means that the rigs must be as light as possible, but we need to create them quickly and properly, uh, while they still need to respond to all of the animators' needs and directors' asks. It is a delicate compromise between efficiency and quality, which can be very challenging. That is why we develop tools to make our life easier. Let's talk about the tools. I will present them to you through examples and with a character of one of our future projects, Go Flash, starting with our auto rig, Keith Rig. Our auto rig has some common points with Rigify. It imports an amateur guide already saved as a reference in another scene. Then we place the bones correctly to match the geometry, adjust some options, and generate the final rig afterwards. We chose to create an in-house auto rig that would better fit our specific needs. It was also a way of ensuring that our animators would have a similar user experience as when using a previous uh, rigs on 3ds Max. The reference guide can be updated if we need to bring a correction uh, on it during our work. It is common to all of our projects, but for some productions with very different kind of character, we can have a specific guide already adjusted specifically to those characters. The main guide is a classical biped, but we also have the possibility of having a quadruped uh, guide if needed. For our presentation, I'll mainly talk about the biped rig. Once the guide appears in the scene, we first adjust it globally with a scale box. This one is useful to predefine an adequate size for the controller. We place every bones and limb on the character on pose mode as it allows us to use the bones rela relationship sorry, between them. To help us placing all of these, uh, we use the copy pass transform, a useful tool if you need to adjust a bone but not its bone children. For example, if you need to adjust the wrist but that the fingers are already placed correctly, it will keep the transformation information in order to re-inject them after the change we made on the bone parents and not lose the correct placement of the fingers. It is a pretty classical guide. You have the two legs and arms, the spine, the fingers, necks, and head. As it can vary a lot between different characters, all other additional parts, uh, like a tail or ears, for example, will be added in a second time. Same things if we need extra arms or legs, we will have to generate the base of the rig first, then use a new guide for those extra limbs. There is almost no facial rigging except for the eyes, eyebrows, jaw, and tongue because we mainly work with shape keys, and I will develop why later on. It works in a mirror way, which means that the right side will be placed exactly like the left one, so we need to place the left side and the right one will automatically follow. If we need something asymmetric, we can at any time disconnect the mirror constraint and manually place the controllers where we want them. As sometimes you need more than three, we can adjust the number of bones in the spine, as well as the number of fingers and the bones inside of them. We can then update the guide display after those bones number changing in order to see and place them correctly. We do not have toes included in our rig, as most of the time we don't have characters with showing ones, but we might add this option for practical, practical reasons. For now, it is still pretty easy to add them. We just save another scene where we place the fingers guide on the toes, generate the rig, rename them, and add it to the main rig afterwards. The last step would be to generate the base of the rigging. What do we call the base? It is common to all of our assets, characters, and props made of five bones that will always be there, the root controllers, if you will. First of all, the master controller that stays in the scene center, except for when the animators need to offset the entire animation. Then we got the world controller, which is used for placing globally the asset in the scene, but it's rarely animated. 
The walk controller serves as an offset if you want your main pivot uh, to another place than the ground, or it's also useful for walks and run single cycles. And then the global scale controller. We separate this transformation from the others. It, is, it can sometimes be a problem with all the stretches in bones or the switch between IK and FK modes. It is a way to expose its value and re-inject it later through drivers and through the rig itself. And finally, we have a hidden controller, the offset one, hidden from the animators in case we need another offset uh, after during the rendering part. Once you created the base, the rest of the rig will be generated based on it, and then we just need to get rid of the guide. And then voila, you have your main rig done. We usually keep one scene saved uh, with the guide before generation as a backup, as it's extremely common to have to regenerate a character rig during a production. It is always safer to keep it in case there is a late change in the design so we don't have to replace everything again. As a company with ongoing productions, it is not always easy to stay up to date with the new version of softwares. So it will take some time to switch from a 3.3 version of Blender to the new 4.0, meaning we won't have the bone collection systems yet, so we'll still be using a layer bones and bones group for a little while, sadly. So for now, at the end of the autoric process, we give our bones, bones groups, color sets that are already preset in order to be more coherent. Uh, all of our characters have the same ones. They are just colors that are used to differentiate the controllers. This tool only works correctly for the autoric bones. Every additional bones uh, would have to get their bones groups assigned manually. Just like Rigify, we have some rig UI panel that we call Custom Pop. In there, we can find a system that connects the rig UI to the bone layers, a simple panel that allows animators to access their controllers stored in different body parts layer. The mechanical and rigging bones being hidden and not linked to this panel so no animators could have access to them and destroy everything, because they love to do that. So what our scene looks like? Before we talk about the other tools, let us have a quick look at our rig and how we work. I have a feeling that every studio works in a different way, so here's how we have our scenes. We have four main collections in which we separate the renderable meshes from non-renderable elements and isolate the animations amateur. For our rigging, we use at least two amateurs. One includes all the controllers and the rig bones, and the other will be exclusively used for skinning. It's bone pointing uh, to bones from the other amateur. So we have one amateur with the bones for skinning only and one for the animation rig in the animation collection. We had to work this way with separated skin amateur with older version of Blender as it used to create a loop in the rig with our spine system. Now the problem doesn't exist anymore, but we kept that way of doing as we often use more than one skinning amateur on a character anyway. It makes it more uniform. It allows us as well to export the mesh and the skinning bones uh, once the animation is done without keeping the rest of the rig. Sometimes, and for most of our characters, we use another skinning amateur in addition, if we want a different kind of influence on a part of a character. We usually work with multiple skinning amateurs to use them for different levels of skinning. As for example, the main amateur will globally deform uh, the face of a character, and the secondary amateur, the one we call wrap, is there to add more details. For example, um, the main skin in there allows us to open the jaw and um, move the top of the head, while the secondary skin allows us to move the mouth globally and nose with different bones influence. On the rig controllers, we can find other rig UI panel that are mostly used for IKFK limbs function or parenting changes. The arm and legs of our characters are made with skin B bones linked to a switching bone from the rig. The UI panel includes control like IKFK switch and hide, arms and layer, curving, scale, or automatic rotate like for shoulder, for example. The parent space panel offers us to change the constraint on the controller and so change its parenting relationship. It is mostly used on hands, feet, or hats, for example. And that would be all for the presenting part of the auto rig. I will now show you some tools we often use during our work. First of all, the Bones Manager, uh, it brings together a bunch of little functions that does simple process, but that we do many times. 
like changing the kind of constraint space, swapping it automatically from local space to world space and the other way around, or remove a constraint on a selection. Well, this one is pretty obvious. It can apply uh, bone as response and reset the mesh modifier. It is used if you want to apply a new bone position and apply the deformation uh, of it on the mesh. It will apply the bone transformation and the modifier on the mesh before adding a new armature modifier. Finally, it creates a skinning bone from a bone selection by selecting the bone controller that we want a skinning influence from and create a skinning bone in the skinning armature constraint to the controller from the animation armature. It will work on multiple bones selected as well. Then we got the spline bones. Uh, we use a lot of them in our project. It is what we use for ropes, chains, and straps mostly. What we call spline bones is just a curve that will have its points and Bezier hooked to controllers, followed by a chain of skinning bones linked to this curve. To use this tool, we need to create the bones that will be the spine hooks controllers. The curve will create itself based on the order of the bones creation. The spline will be having a hook modifier pointing on each of the bones we just created, linking the vertices of the spline to our controllers. Once the spline is done, the tool will create a chain of bones that are constrained to the curve with a spline IK modifier. They will be used as skinning bones for the geometry to follow the spline and its deformation. It is a simple and not so heavy way to deal with um, shaped key, uh, sh sorry, rope shaped assets, which is very useful when you have a TV show budget. The next one will be the bendy stretch. It's one of my favorites. It creates a rig lattice that will deform itself in a bendy, stretchy, squashy way. And it's very satisfying to play with it. It is a must-have for cartoon TV shows. Animators will use it all the time to give the assets a more cartoonish way to move or react. For the cartoon show, it is used on most of our props and uh, on the head of our characters. We use it even on our more realistic show, like Athleticus, as it can be useful to cheat on the motion of an asset sometimes. Our tool will import from a reference scene the lattice rig and the armature that goes with it. We just need to merge the last one with the main armature and arrange the rest in the scene. This lattice has two simple modifiers with a um, driver for its strength and angle value. Those drivers are, are all connected directly to the stretch controllers or to the bend one, which takes calculation of distance between two rigging bones. This allows us to have, on the same lattice, a stretch effect and a bend that goes in four directions. It is not very heavy, and once again, we use it all the time on our assets. Next one will be the puppet creators. Puppets are a low version of a character, divided in a lot of pieces. So an animator can start an animation with the volume of a character, uh, but it is less precise, but way lighter than the renderable mesh. It is mostly used during the blocking phase of the animation. Our tool here will duplicate the meshes of the character that we have selected, get rid of all the modifiers and texture on it, and cut it in a bunch of pieces based on the skinning vertex group. It will then do a simple parenting of those pieces to the bone that had a major influence on them. It's not a complicated process, but like a lot of our tools, it saves us a lot of time. It gives us a very disconstructed character, but way lighter to work with it. It is very useful when you have many characters in the same shot, which actually happens a lot in our production. And finally, the specific cases. This part is more about specific cases we had to deal with during a production. It is less about tools, but more about rigging process examples. First of all, the facial rigging, shape keys and bones. Um, at Cube Creative, we are used to mostly work the facial expressions with shape keys. It is a choice we made as we often realize that directors have a very precise idea of what kind of facial expression they want, and ringing isn't usually enough for most of them. They will always want the corner of the mouth more pointy, the lip more curled in a certain way. I guess the best way is probably a mix of both techniques, but we don't have an automatic facial rig for TV shows yet, and uh, we are on a short timing, and we don't have the time to manually create one for each character. The prob problem of it would be the, white, the weight as well. Facial rigging can be pretty heavy, with a lot of bones or bendy bones. As you know, most of our projects are TV shows. So we still have the constraint of making it as light as possible, 
And shape keys are the good way to have a large panel of expressions while keeping the character rig as light as we can. So for now, we mostly work with shape keys and sometimes when it's really needed, um, we had some facial expression controllers. But adding shame keys can take time, so we have at least a tool to separate the left and the right side with a smooth blend in the middle. Our character modeling artists create their shape keys symmetrically, then we separate them afterwards. This tool will base itself on the selection and duplicate the meshes for the right and left side. The neutral meshes uh, stay in the middle and will have a mix of both of the side of the shape. For the mirror process, it basically works with a vertex weight proximity modifier on the left and right meshes. This modifier will pick a previously made grid as a reference and uh, the shape will activate itself with a smooth gradient that we need to adjust for every shape. Once we are satisfied with our shapes, we select again the neutral meshes in the middle, then we can export the sided shape keys. It will strike in the scene every shape key, left and right, now ready to be merged with the rest of the rig. For the rest of the process, we do it manually for now. We create controls that will drive the shape keys and connect them with drivers. Those tools are pretty new in Blender for us, so they will probably evolve and be updated with our next production. Next one would be the child love. Uh, the child of constraint allows us to um, use the existing skin of a mesh to wrap a bone or a part of the rig on it. And so it will perfectly follow the mesh deformations without being deformed itself. For example, if you have a button that needs to follow your spine and its deformation, but you want to keep it shape follow but not being deformed by the spine, the rig will follow the skin and deformations of the mesh without being impacted by it. We use it mostly for pieces of clothing or accessories and characters, but we can also use it to have a reference controller on something that gets deformed a lot. For example, a rope that is being stretched and flaps around. If a character needs to grab it, it hence needs to stay at the same place on the rope without being deformed, and that is a very good way to do it without being too heavy. And finally, the get pose. What we call the get pose is another armature a bit like our skinning one, but only for rigging this time. It is used when we need uh, to rig a mesh while it's straight, but it needs a default posing afterwards uh, for the rest of the production. Like for example, a pigtail. A pigtail is better to rig straight, so the deformation will stay neat, but it needs to be already twisted for the animation when they start a shot. So we have different armature that will be animated between the frame 0 and 10 as our shots only begins at the frame 101. The animation armature will pick on this get pose armature, which will be animated to already have a good posing ready to go. We have to go through this hidden armature to keep it separated from the made uh, animated run. The animation action will be stored separately and untouched by the animators, and their armature will stay clear of animation actions. There will be no risk of them deleting by accident. Accident. <laughs> It has already been uh, very useful for many cases and works with our pipeline. And that will be all. So now I'll leave you in the perfectly capable hands of Tongi. <laughs> we'll talk to you about how to, we deal with the recuperation of our animation in render scenes. Thank you, Manon. Uh, that last um, animation was lovely. So, um, let's talk about how we bring everything from our animation files to our render files. The first question we should ask ourselves is, why bother with um, scene and data conversion? Why not just use the animation file for rendering? Since 2018, we, have missed, um, we haven't missed a Blender conference, and it gave us the opportunity to share ideas about pipeline and tools with other technical artists. And I learned that uh, some other studios used um, the animation files straight for rendering, so that the, all the rigs and animation data were included in the files that were sent to rendering. So this drives me to do my best to give you a clear idea of why we chose to do things the way we do at Cube Creative. So, 
why bake everything before rendering? Um, first of all, the, the pros. Uh, we want to reduce computing costs as much as possible. This applies to render times, but also to the time a lighting, lighting artist would spend on a shot. Our scenes are already far more complex than we'd like them to be, so we'll take every chance we have to make them more responsive. Replacing the animated rigs by animated mesh cache makes the life of lighting artists much easier. We also want uh, our Blender files to be as stable as possible, and we believe that uh, removing every unnecessary layer of complexity is a good step toward that goal. And obviously, nobody likes high render times, especially not our head of studio, Cecile. And um, this is more or less an issue depending on the project, but we, we will generally tend to reduce render times in every way we can think of. And the last but not the least, baking everything and exporting animation caches allows us to easily update the animation data without losing the work already done on lighting. In the context of a production, we often have to adjust things in animation after the first rendering pass is complete. So um, this is a, a very important point for us. Of course, there is a trade-off. Uh, and with those gains comes a few downsides. First of all, uh, we don't want anybody to handle this step manually. Most of the episodes we work on have around 200 shots, so things need to get automated. This means we need a strong development team on which we rely heavily. Then for every step we want to automate and for everything we want to bake, a naming convention is, uh, is needed, and we need to follow it rigorously in every single shot. The first step towards automation is ensuring uh, cons consistency across our files. We need our scripts to, and tools to know what they are dealing with and what they need to bake. As a result, we lose a bit of uh, technical uh, flexibility. Ensuring this consistency means we can't allow some technical solution that would have been great in some other contexts. Surprisingly enough, uh, giving up this bit of technical flexibility ends up giving us much more artistic freedom. We spend less time thinking about how we should do things and more time actually doing them. With all those points being considered, uh, we believe that uh, the benefits are worth the few sacrifices we have to make, and we chose to bake as much thing as we can um, when transferring from animation to rendering. <clears throat> so in this next part, um, I try to answer the next question, which is how do we keep the animation while getting rid of the rigs in, in our files? and what it implies for our rigging department. So the first scenario is quite obvious. Uh, it's about mesh deformations. Blender offers multiple ways of um, baking mesh deformation. And um, at the moment, we use point cache files. For those who are unfamiliar with it, this uh, format simply contains the position of every vertices at every frame. It doesn't contain any mesh data, just its deformations. The downside of it is um, it requires one file per object, so you end up with a lot of objects when you have a complex scene. We used to store uh, the mesh deformation in alambic format, but we figured out that meshes with uh, hair particles handle deformation much better with point catch file than alambic file. This method doesn't allow us to transfer every aspect of the mesh data animation, such as animated UV channels, for example, but I'll get to that a bit later. Now that we have successfully transferred mesh deformation, let's have a look at animated properties. At Cube Creative, we ensure that the animators only have to manipulate animation controllers. This is us trying to avoid things being broken at animation stage. As a result, if a property is animated, it means it's driven by the rig. So we have to bake the value on every single frame if we want the animation to stick around while the rig is gone. The tricky part is finding out uh, the naming conventions that allows us to give the tool the information of which values should it bake. So just a short side note, 
side note to help you with uh, my following points. As some of you probably know, um, a few Blender tools rely on a three-letter code naming convention. For in instance, Blender allows a user to define which bones should be considered for automatic skinning by including def, D-E-F, in their name. Other such conventions exist as MCH for mechanical bones or WGT for widget. We decided to build upon this principle and as a result, every object in our scene has a three-letter code including in the name which inform our tools, scripts, and artists of its purpose. So back to animation now. Um, animators work with lighter versions of shaders, and in some cases, those shaders get animated. It can be anything from a change in its color to a complex transition between two different shaders. This animation, of course, needs to be baked, and applied to the render version of this shader into the render files. In order to make our life easier, we restrict those animations to value node. We make sure to give them a specific name that includes DRV, a three-letter code for drivers. It's also a convenient way to, for the shading artist to make sure our shader values will be rigged. They would just have to include DRV in the node names. This method doesn't apply in every cases, and we can't rename every property in Blender, and that's for the best. So when we don't find a more elegant way of doing things, we include in the script a hard-coded list of the values that systematically need to be baked. As I said, this includes data properties that can't be given custom names, such as the camera's focal length, the camera's clipping distances, uh, lights values, such as powers, um, angles, or colors, and uh, vid visibility values for um, every renderable mesh, and others. So now let's talk a bit about uh, geometry nodes. Two years ago, we jumped from Blender 2.7 to Blender 3, and this was quite a leap. Uh, among the few features we gained were uh, geometry nodes, and objects that have geometry nodes uh, modifiers are a tricky topic because their nature can change a lot. A curve often becomes a mesh. A mesh might turn into a volume, and on a regular basis, multiple types coexist in a single object. Earlier, I, talk about, I talked about um, the benefits of giving up a bit of technical freedom, but the first thing we want to do with using geometry nodes is certainly not giving up technical freedom. For those reasons, we chose to keep the geometry nodes modifiers in our render files and not trying to bake the results, because trying to streamline this process seemed like a very bad idea. That being said, we still have geometry nodes that are affected by the rig in some ways, and in those cases, we need to find methods to bake those animations to keep them while the rig is gone. If we need a simple value to be baked, we expose it in the input of the node tree and we include DRV in its name. This is the exact same method that we use for shaders. On the other hand, if we need a transformation information to be baked, we use what we call the buffer objects. They are usually an empty object with BUF buff in their name. The three letter informs our tool that the transformation channels need to be baked from coming to from animation to rendering. And up to this point, those uh, two methods allows us to uh, keep those animation of uh, geometry nodes assets from uh, animation to rendering. And this is an example of uh, a use case of those buffer objects. Um, these geometry node objects, which is a flame, is driven by two objects, we could have included them as um, um, geometry node inputs, but it was much simpler to handle as separated objects. Another use case of those uh, buffer objects is when we use them to project UVs on meshes. On most of the cases, baking their transformations enable us to keep the UV animation as it is, from animation to rendering. However, in some cases, due to the bones hierarchy and some non-homothetics transformations, 
the projectors end up with a shear and a skew transformation. This cannot be reproduced only with transformation channels. So in those cases, the buffer object isn't sufficient to bake the UV animation. So we end up um, adding keyframes on UV channels for every frame of this animation. This ends up being quite heavy, so we tend to avoid this method um, as much as we can. So the last subject I want to tackle with you is the one that led to the most headaches. It's the subject of baking hair deformation. I won't be talking about baking hair simulation, but rather baking hair that was being deformed by a rig. The new hair and first system, which uses geometry nodes, has been out for quite some time now. But uh, on our current projects, we work on assets that were designed um, with the current and the, the previous hair system. In the last few years, we, we met some big challenges while trying to bake those animations. Some of them look like bug, other are features maybe, and a fair share of them might just be curiosities that nobody knew about. So this part gets a bit specific. It might soon get outdated, but I thought it might help others that encounter the same limits. This is a condensed version of all the information we would have loved to have two years ago. So to illustrate my point, with, um, I, I will use this uh, example of a horse tail. This is a very good example of the get pose method Manon showed us just before with the, the pigtail. The tail needs to be straight and horizontal to be properly rigged, but it's much more convenient for the animators to get it in pose as soon as they open their shot. Therefore, we include this animation um, to, to the pose mode in the rigging file. So first of all, a few basic limits about rigging hair in Blender. Hair cannot be deformed by bones and vertex groups. However, lattices actually can deform, be deformed with uh, bones and vertex groups, and hair can be deformed with uh, lattices. This means we can use lattice as an extra step for deforming hair with bones and uh, vertex groups. Another important thing is that uh, lattices cannot be baked with alambic file nor with the point cache file. So in order to keep the animation in our render files, we use our buffer objects, which have their transformation baked. This implies that we have one empty object for each vertex of the lattice, and this can get a bit busy with um, lattices with bigger resolution. So here's the sensitive part, the, the limits that we discovered bit by bit while working on our projects. First of all, a mesh can be deformed by multiple lattices, but the hair particles that are emitted from it are only deformed by the first lattice. This has a big impact on the way we approach rigging, because it means that if a mesh has hair on its surface, we cannot use more than one lattice to deform it. However, as Manon explained earlier, we use multiple skinning layers on our characters. This involves that the mesh emitting the hair must be deformed by multiple means. A lattice can in fact accumulate multiple deformation, such as deformation from another lattice, an armature, constraints, or shape keys. In the end, we manage to get the deformation we want um, on the hair modifier with only one lattice, because our rigging team is very talented. Another limit we stumbled upon was the fact that uh, when child particles are in interpolated mode, they are not properly affected by a lattice. That meant that in every case we wanted to rig hair, children's hair had to be set to simple mode. This greatly impacts the look of hair, and in some cases, uh, it led to a bit of a change in the asset look in the end, which is always a pity. And um, the last impacting thing that we discovered with the Blender Hair system is that children particles don't deform properly when affected by a lattice as their roots don't stick to the surface. This as well led some adaptation with the grooming of a few assets. To make this behavior less obvious, we tend to increase the number of uh, parent particles to be able to decrease the radius of the ch children's hair around it. 
and it's also less visible when the root of the hair is perpendicular to the, to the surface. So, as a conclusion uh, on this hair topic, we ended with a, a list of constraints that we had to keep in mind and follow rigorously when we wanted to be able to rig and animate hair. First of all, we have to use a single lattice and nothing else to deform the hair and its emitting geometry. We also um, keep uh, children in simple mode, otherwise they're not properly deformed by the, the lattice. And, sorry. And we want to, to keep our parents' particle uh, number high to be able to reduce the, the radius of a uh, children's hair. And um, because I don't want to end this talk on the, I want to end this talk on a positive note, I will say that the, um, although young and, and new, the, the new hair system with uh, geometry nodes looks very promising, and we can't wait to use it in the um, context of an actual production. And the fact that it takes geometry nodes as its foundation is a promise of a bright future for us. Thank you very much. Um, if you guys have any questions, I guess we have, a, we have time for, for a few questions if you have any.